Good morning. Welcome to the Franklin Baptist Church. I am so glad to see you here today. God bless you for choosing to come and worship with us. Uh, and I'm glad that you're healthy enough to be here. I know there's been a lot of sickness going around, but I'm glad uh, that uh, you're doing well enough to be here today. And, uh, and today we've got a very special service. Uh, we don't have a choir on a regular basis, but we do have a group of people that we have recruited and pulled together to sing. They've worked hard in preparing for this, and I know there'll be a special blessing to you. And let me encourage you today, as, uh, as our choir sings, uh, we're not here to entertain you. We're here to worship God and praise Him for the gift of Jesus Christ. And there's these songs have been picked for a reason. There's a special message for each one of us here today as we worship our Savior. And so I would encourage you as the choir sings, would you worship the Lord with us and give Him thanks and praise and let him work in your life here today. Let's begin with the word of prayer as we ask God to bless this service here together. With heads bowed and eyes closed, your Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you so much for the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, who was born on this earth some 2,000 years ago in such a humble manner, dear Lord, so that he could be our Savior. Help us, I pray today, dear Lord, to lift up and exalt Jesus Christ in every song that's sung, dear Lord, and every offering that's given in the preaching of your word. And, and I just pray that through the singing of this choir, dear Lord, that Jesus Christ to be lifted up as that, that gift of life given in that manger, dear Lord, is that gift of eternal life given on the cross. I pray that Christ to be lifted up. And I pray that each of us, dear Lord, open up our hearts and our minds and our ears, dear Heavenly Father, receive what you have for us. And I pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David.
But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. I'm sure he must have been surprised at where this road had taken him cause never in a million lives would he have dreamed of Bethlehem so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned.
Amen. I'll tell you what, I appreciate so much y'all being here today. And uh, I just want to remind you, when we think about the manger, we think about the gift of Jesus Christ, we think about Christmas, we're not just talking about presents under a tree, and we're not just talking about a baby in a manger. We're talking about our Savior that died for our sins, yours and mine. And so at this time, we're going to go on ahead and uh, dismiss the choir. I'm going to give you a chance to get around fellowship and shake hands and greet one another here for a few moments as our choir is dismissed. And as our kids head back to Children's Church, let me encourage you to get around and fellowship and visit with one another here for a few moments. seats and uh, stand, if you will, um, as we sing our first song, um, hymn number 250, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
seated um, uh, hymn number 253 silent night <laughs> singing here today and I appreciate you being here for our choir. As our ushers make their way forward today, uh, let me encourage you today to continue our worship here as we give back to the Lord an offering as He has blessed us. And uh, today is traditionally we do our change for children on the third Sunday of the month and, and uh, just the way the service fell, we didn't do that. But I would encourage you if you have loose change for change for children, just put it in the offering plate. All the loose change will go towards our children's ministry uh, today. And so feel free to just drop that in the offering plate, and it will go to the proper place. All the loose change goes to children's ministry. And continue to support our children, our children's ministry as well, and those that serve, and the parents involved in that as well. But you give back today as God has blessed you. Be faithful with your tithes and your faith promise missions giving. And, uh, and then I would also encourage you, if you're a visitor, thank you for being with us today. Feel free to drop in a, a visitor card in the offering plate as well, so we can have a record of your visit. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to bless us here as we give our offerings with heads bowed and eyes closed. Brother Mike Duncan, would you lead us as we pray, please, sir?
privilege of life today. We thank you for the gift of salvation and everything done on the cross, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do want to mention a, a couple things really quickly here. I would um, encourage you to get by as you have a chance and and um, let Nina know how much you appreciate all the choir members. I think they, they showed up for practice. They did a great job, and and I, I think that they, they did great. I hesitate to say that because I know I was part of the choir, but in spite of me, the, the choir did awesome today and, and did all their practices, and I really appreciate them. And Nina really just kind of took charge and, and headed up all of that, and she did an awesome job, and, and, uh, and I appreciate Brandon reading the scriptures as well, and um, uh, I was told that Brandon really wanted to sing, but he was told he wasn't allowed to sing, so yeah, so he read scripture instead, but uh, everybody's got a gift, and everybody's got a talent, and uh, and not everybody's got the same one, but I appreciate all those that worked so hard on that, and uh, it really was a blessing. Continue to pray for a music ministry of the Franklin Baptist Church. We want to see it grow and increase and, and be able to do more. I appreciate our praise team that comes together and sings every Sunday, and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, we're always looking for more people that want to sing and use their talents for the Lord and uh and my hope is, and I haven't, I haven't told anybody this, uh, I didn't tell nine of this, but I'd like us maybe to have an Easter choir as well and, uh, and sing something special for Easter and, and, uh, and, and maybe be able to build us up to where we can have a regular choir again. But I would encourage you to get involved in the music ministry. If God's given you that gift, and there's a place for you here. There's definitely an opportunity for you to use it in, uh, in the praise team and future choir specials as, as well as in singing specials as well. But I appreciate those that use their talents for the Lord here and I appreciate their singing and uh, what a blessing it was to be able to have that this morning so thank you for being here and a part of that and so make sure you get by and let those folks know that you appreciate them and what they have done as uh, as we get ready for christmas and Christmas is now just a, uh, just a week away. Um, as we get ready for Christmas, I know many of us are, are probably have got a list of, of Christmas movies that we watch. Um, and, and probably everyone's got their favorites as well. And, and, and some of y'all like the old traditional ones, I'm sure. Uh, maybe the old black and white ones. Uh, some of y'all may like some of the more recent ones. Um, uh, but, uh, but I'm sure there's a, there's a list of, of Christmas, classic Christmas movies that you probably try to watch as uh, we get closer to Christmas. And it's interesting, as you watch these movies, so many of them, certainly the classic ones, have all got something in common uh, that, uh, that I find to be very intriguing. Um, and, uh, and, and, and let me just share with you a few classic Christmas movies and some of the characters that they have in common. If y'all like The Grinch Stole Christmas, uh, the uh, Dr. Seuss classic, uh, then you will remember uh, the Grinch. And, uh, uh, and, and for some reason, I can't uh, advance this one here. So uh, hold on a second. Let's see if I can make this, make this thing work. And I won't be able to, but uh, I apologize. But, uh, but the, we have The Grinch. Can you go ahead and advance? Hit, click the button there, Cameron, as I go. And uh, just click the advance button. There you go. There's The Grinch. And, uh, and so in The Grinch Stole Christmas, of course, he's the star of the show, The Grinch. And it's a wonderful life. You have Henry Potter. Not Harry Potter. Uh, Y'all remember, uh, uh, remember the, the villain of the... 
of the movie Harry Potter. I uh, Henry Potter, there I go again. This is going to be a repeat of last week's Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus thing, I think. Uh, but I won't, I won't dwell on Henry Potter. Uh, I'll mess that, mess that up. But, but Henry Potter was, the, uh, was, was, was a, a key ingredient there in a, it's a Wonderful Life. In the movie A Christmas Carol, of course, there's Ebenezer Scrooge, once again, the star of the show. And, and, uh, and, and I, don't know, I don't know about you, when I think of A, uh, a, a Christmas Carol and, and the movie version, I always think of that one there with George C. Scott. Anybody else? Is that the one that y'all remember? No, just me. All right. Uh, my kids recently had us watch uh, a, a Muppet Christmas Carol where all the Muppets took part. And uh, But I remember the George C. Scott one when I was growing up. That's the one we used to watch. And uh, But he is, of course, the key element of, of A Christmas Carol uh, in A Christmas Story. Uh, there's Farkas, of course. Y'all remember Farkas with the yellow eyes uh, in, in A Christmas Story. And, and Home Alone, it had the wet bandits. And if y'all, if Home Alone's one of your favorite uh, uh, Christmas stories, there's the wet bandits there. And then, of course, in everyone's favorite, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, they had the abominable snowman in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And, of course, what is, what is the uh, similarity in all of these movies and with all these characters? They're all the villains. And the villains play a key element in our Christmas stories. Uh, in all of our Christmas movies, and we could go down the list. There's others as well, and and, and maybe the greatest, and maybe the greatest of all uh, Christmas specials is, of course, the Charlie Brown Christmas. Amen. That's the uh, that's the best one of all, and and even there, there's Lucy that that derides and puts down poor old Charlie Brown. Uh, every almost every one of these, uh, almost every one of these Christmas movies have a Christmas villain. And when we open up our Bibles, and when we look, and I want you to look with me in Matthew chapter. Chapter number one, uh, we're going to find that that uh, that the, the account of Jesus's birth, the original, if you will, uh, Christmas story, and I, and I, I want to be careful using the term story. It's not a fictional thing. Where we're not comparing, we're not we're, we're not saying it's like Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, the Grinch stole Christmas, or a Christmas Carol. This is a true account of Jesus's birth. As we go back to the source material of Christmas for us. And the account of Jesus being born, here we find once again a villain is taking a key place in the account of Jesus' birth. And of course that villain that we know so well, that original Christmas villain, is Herod, Herod the Great. And if you look with me in Matthew chapter number 1, and, and we're going to read through the first 16 verses here. As I read aloud, open your Bibles, please follow along. As I read Matthew chapter number, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter number 2. I apologize, that reference is wrong in the note on the screen there. Matthew chapter number 2, we'll begin at verse number 1. If we'd have begun in Matthew chapter number one, we'd have gone through the uh, uh, all the genealogy of Jesus. That would have been a that would have been a long, a long hard read. But uh, we're going to go to Matthew chapter number two, verse number one. The Bible says, "Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him.'" When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And we pause right there for just a moment. And, and here's the wise men come to, to Jerusalem. They come to the king, King Herod. He's the authority. He should know where everybody's at and what's going on in his kingdom. Certainly where the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be born. And at this point, Herod seems to be very helpful. He seems to be on board with what the wise men are doing. And so he encourages them that when they find the Messiah, the young child, they're supposed to come back and let him know so that he can come, he says. So he says, and worship him also. And then in verse number 9, the Bible says, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. 
When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to his house, into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and thou... And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked to the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Here we have Herod the great the king uh, appointed by the Roman emperor, but, but he was the king over Israel at that time. And here he was when Jesus Christ was born, receives the wise men, uh, gets information for them, sends them out. And of course, claiming that he wants to worship him. But in truth, he is the one that wants to destroy Jesus Christ. He's the, ones that, he's the one that wants to diminish the Messiah. He's the one that wants to refuse the, the coming Savior. And we find his hatred, his bitterness is so great. Not only is he willing to lie, not only is he willing to deceive, not only is he willing to manipulate others to, to meet his own ends, but he's willing to go out there and slay every child in Jerusalem from the age of two and under in hopes that he might destroy Jesus Christ. And you say, my goodness, what a terrible villain. In our, in our movies, we look at the Grinch, or, or, or we, lo we, we look at, at, at a bully, or we look at bandits, and, and, and we look at mean people. But, but here's a real villain. Here's real cruelty. Here's real horrible actions. And unfortunately, there's still Herods out there today. There are still those that want to diminish Christ. There's still those that want to destroy who Jesus is. And limit his potential of working and moving in hearts and lives today. Today as we talk about the Christmas villains, let's take a look inside. I want to know what kind of Christmas you're going to have this year. Let's pray and ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for your working and moving, dear Lord, to overcome the evil in this world. And to offer us hope today. And I just pray that you just guide and direct each and every one of us, dear Heavenly Father, that we just overcome the evil and the temptations and the wickedness of this world, dear Lord. Overcome the obstacles that Jesus Christ might be exalted and praised. That we might have a Christmas, dear Heavenly Father, that glorifies and honors you. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, you guide and direct me as I share your message, your word, dear Lord. Hide me behind the cross, dear Lord, that Jesus Christ would increase. That I would decrease, dear Lord. And I just pray that your spirit would work and move in each and every heart that's here today. That we just be transformed and changed by the hope of the message of Christmas, dear Lord. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me share with you a couple thoughts here and a couple potential Christmases that we could have. And, and the first one is a tragic Christmas. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, you might think, well, I certainly hope I don't have a tragic Christmas. And, and that might mean different things to different people. And, and, and you might think, well, you know, there might be hardships and difficulties this Christmas. That would be tragic, you know, to have not, not to have money to buy uh, presents or to have family get sick or have other problems over the holidays. That would be tragic. And, and there are much worse things than not having money at Christmas time. There's much worse things, even even than, than not having uh, um, uh, family or loved ones around at Christmas. There are much worse things than that. And, and here I want to describe for you, and here's, here's the first Christmas. I hear it, of course. And, and let, me, let me just be clear. Let me back up just a moment. The accounts that are taking place primarily, uh, uh, they begin at Christmas, uh, but most likely they culminate maybe up to two years after Jesus' birth. 
And of course, we read that in our text that, that when the wise men finally get to where Jesus is, He's no longer in a stable, in a manger. He's now in a house. And, and so they've moved on from that place. And, and not only that, but we also read that when, when, uh, uh, when, uh, when uh, Herod decides to, to slaughter the children in Bethlehem, uh, based on the time frame that the wise men gave him, he decided he needed to kill every child that was two years old and younger in hopes of, of killing uh, that child because of the time that the star first appeared. And so, so, so accounting the, when the star first appeared and the wise men first began their journey, uh, it would have been uh, maybe up to two years after the actual birth of Christ. But this is all an important part of this Christmas account. And certainly here for Herod, this is the first opportunity that he's had to hear about the birth of Jesus. This is his first chance, if you will, to celebrate uh, the, the Messiah and Christmas, certainly for the wise men as well. It's their first opportunity to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So for them, it is still the first Christmas, even though it's a rather extended one. But I'll tell you what, it can be a very tragic one, unfortunately. And certainly for Herod, it was a tragic Christmas. And not because of, of what he did, but it started with his heart. Selfishness is tragic. Selfishness is tragic. And here Herod, all he can see when the wise men come to him, and they come to worship Christ, they come to give him gifts and to give him themselves and to give him praise. But Herod, the king, in verse number 3, when he heard these things, was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And we find his heart is expounded upon throughout this passage. He is jealous. He is bitter. He is selfish. All he can think about is, what does it mean if a, if a Messiah is born, if a king is born, what does that mean for me as king? How does that influence me? How does that change me? And I'll be honest with you folks, you know, as, as kids, we have that tendency to, to be a little bit selfish and a little bit greedy. Christmas becomes about, you know, the presents under the tree. It becomes about what am I going to get? You know, what kind of gift am I, is someone going to give to me? But even as adults, it becomes more about us. It becomes more about getting than it does about giving. It becomes about, about being happy and about cheerful and about, about happy feelings and happy thoughts and, and having joy. And, and, and then, if boy, I'll tell you what, if things don't go our way because the traffic's bad and, and, and the mall is crowded and, and, and the items aren't on sale that I wanted to get. And, and, and pretty soon we can, we can turn something beautiful, the birth of Jesus Christ, into something where there's just bitterness because of our feelings, because of our our, 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 our problems because of the, the issues that we have to face. But Christmas is not about you and it's not about me. And when it becomes focused on us, whether for good or for bad, what I can get or, or the problems I've got, it becomes selfish, it becomes tragic. Can I encourage you today? There is so much to give in this world. You have so much to give. Not just to get, you have so much to give. You can give love and support and encouragement. You can share the hope of Jesus Christ with a track, with a good word, with a testimony, with an invitation to church. You have so much to give. And you can, you can support the needy. There are opportunities. There is so much need in our world today. There are so many opportunities to help people out in need. And, and, and there are great needs, which means that for us Christians, there is great opportunities to, to think about others, to serve others, to do something for somebody else else and I know we tend towards selfishness several months ago my wife and I were leaving Walmart and, and I may have told you all this story once before but we were leaving Walmart and, and as we are going to get in the car we, I saw this woman she was pushing her cart full of groceries out in the parking lot and, and I could see she was just kind of looking around she had done what many of us have done have you ever done this you walk out of Walmart and you forgot where you parked Amen? Be honest. I did that once, just once. And I noticed her out there, and, and she was just she was an older lady, and, and, and then we get in the car, and we load up our groceries, we get in the car, and I start to pull out, and I notice she's further over. She's still, this is several minutes later, she's still pushing her car, still looking around trying to find her car. And, and we start to pull out, and honestly, and... Huh, I'm already thinking. She's already caught my attention. She's already struggling to find her car. 
And I've, I've, I, here's what I've done. I've just ignored it. I've pushed it back. I've said it's not my problem. You know, she's, she'll find it eventually. There's a limited number of cars. She's not going to get lost. She'll be fine. But already, I'll, I'll, but already she's, she's caught my, she's already on my heart. She's already on my, and, and before I get to the end of the, end of the row, I, I turn around and I come back and Crystal, we didn't even discuss it. But she goes, you're going to go help her, aren't you? Because she was feeling the same thing. She saw this woman. She was in need. He said it's a simple little problem, but, I, but usually it's a problem that's fixed pretty fast. But this, the Lord just burdened my heart for this woman. And so I turned back and found a parking spot again and parked and went over there. And I said, Let me, can I help you find your car? She said, yes, please. I, and, and she, she <laughs> God bless her, uh, she didn't know the make or model, but it was, you know, she, she kind of knew the color. And, and it, was, it was rough, you know, when you don't have a lot of information, and even about your own car. And, and uh, we went through, and, and so I could, I, you know, I wasn't pushing a cart, and, and I could make ground faster than her. And so I went through, and pretty soon I found her car, and I flagged her down. And is this your car? Yes, it is. And, and, uh, but I'll be honest with you there. I had to battle my selfishness. And it, it took me three minutes, four minutes to help this woman out. She was struggling, but I had to battle my selfishness just to give that little bit. There are opportunities to help if we're willing to push down our selfishness, not make it all about me. I can give up a few more dollars. I can give up a little bit more time. I can give up a little bit of, 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 of thinking about myself to help somebody else out. But if Christmas is just about us, if it's not about meeting other needs and serving other people and being a blessing, how tragic is that? Selfishness is tragic. I'll tell you what, ignoring the Scripture is tragic. Ignoring the Scripture is tragic. Oh, Herod's an interesting person in this text. I, I'll be honest with you. He's... Well, he's a lot like us. He has a little bit of belief. He has a little bit of Bible. Uh, he, he's, willing to, he's willing to accept some of it. But not all of it. Uh, look in verse number 4 and 5. Here the wise men had come to him. He's troubled because he hears about the king of the Jews is going to be born. And so verse number four, when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Here he is, he turns to the Bible experts. And he says, what does the Bible say? Where is the Christ going to be born? Where is the King of the Jews going to be born? And so, and so I, it's, I find it perplexing. I find it interesting, but I find it so much like us. He's willing to go to the Bible if it's going to help him out. He's willing to go to the Bible if it's willing to give him what he wants. He's willing to agree with the Bible only in the terms that, that, that he's going to, it's, it's going to satisfy him and complete him. And again, I know we're bordered on the selfishness again, but here he is taking the Scripture only as far as it will help him. Him. And the Bible's going to tell him exactly where to send these wise men. The Bible's going to tell him that it's in Bethlehem. And he goes back in the Old Testament and he finds the prophecies that, 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 that in little old Bethlehem would be born the king of the Jews. And so he accepts it. He accepts that much of it. But he ignores the fact that this is going to be his governor. He ignores the fact that this is going to be his king. He ignores the fact that this is going to be the Messiah, the Christ. He only takes what he wants and nothing else. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All of the Bible is good. All of the Bible is God's Word. All of the Bible is true. All of it will benefit you if you will accept all of it. Not just a part of it. You can't pick and choose. 
How tragic it is when we just pick and choose and we say, I like the part where it says love your neighbor, but I don't like the part where it says not to commit adultery or where it says not to lie or where it says not to steal. I, I, I like the part, you know, when it tells those people what they're doing is wrong, but I don't like the part where it tells me what I'm doing is wrong. And we cannot pick and choose, but so many of us do just like Herod. And he's going to pick and choose. And, and we'll do the same thing at Christmas time. Oh, we love to sing the Christmas carols. We love to see the kids' nativity play. And, 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 and we love to, you know, we, we'll put the nativity set up in our house. But I'll tell you what, Christmas for us, it's all about the presents. And it's about the food. And it's about the parties. And it's about the celebration. And all of a sudden, when Christmas time actually comes, we forget all about Jesus and the Bible. Because we pick and choose. Just like Herod. How tragic when we ignore the scriptures. We ignore what God's word has to say. And I'll tell you what else is tragic. It's ignoring or disregarding the Savior. I know all these go hand in hand. The selfishness and, and ignoring the scripture. And now disregarding the Savior. Herod has, has got some faith. And, and, and bear with me here. When Herod wants to know where the Messiah is born, he, he, he believes what the Bible says. He believes what the Bible says. And so obviously he believes that, that this child that's going to be born in Bethlehem is going to be the Christ. He's going to be the king. He has some faith in, in Christ that, that, that this is going to be the king. This is, he's sent from God. He's the Messiah. So much so that he feels threatened by him. And he knows he's got to cut him off and kill him. Because of his, you know, once again, his selfishness. He feels threatened. So he's got a small amount of faith. How many of us have only got a small amount of faith? Let me ask you today, how many of you today, you say uh, you, you would say, oh, I, I believe God and, and, and I believe the Bible. I don't really you know, practice it. It's not like I actually come to church or read it or, or, or pray or anything, but I believe it. And, 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 and I, I believe in Jesus. But how many of us have asked Jesus Christ to be our Savior, trusted in Him to, to save us from our sins? How many of us believe that Jesus was born of a virgin and lived a sinless life and that He died on Calvary's cross to pay the price for your sins and mine and, and He was buried, but he, he rose up out of that grave and conquered death three days later? How many of us believe what the Bible says about Jesus and that He's not just a man, He's not just a prophet, He's not just a good man, but He is God come down in the flesh? How many of us believe what, what the angel told told Joseph in Matthew chapter number 1 that he's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. He's going to be God in human form. How many of us believe that Jesus Christ is God? How many of us believe what the Bible says about Jesus? What we believe about Jesus Christ is the litmus test for our faith, for our salvation. Don't take Him in part. Don't accept Jesus in part. And say, well, I believe he was, he was good. I believe he was honorable. I believe he had some good teaching for me. Do you believe that he's your Savior that paid for your sins? And have you received that gift? What do you believe about Jesus Christ? In 1 John 5, 1, the Bible says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. What do you believe about Jesus? Is He your Savior? Is He your Lord? Is He the one that you're serving and following? Is He your King? Or are you your King? Or is the dollar bill your King? Or is a political party your King? Or is a sports team your King? Who are you worshiping? Who are you following today? Who is, who is Lord of your life? He that believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. What have you done with Jesus Christ? Folks, you can have a tragic Christmas. It's not hard to do. You can have presents and parties and smiles and fun. And it can be wasted and tragic. It can be no better than Herod's Christmas. 
or you could have a transforming Christmas. You could have a transforming Christmas. You know, all those movie villains that I talked about, well, most of them anyways, there's a transformation. That's what we love about those stories. Of course, the Christmas Carol is the classic one where Scrooge is visited by the ghost and, and then when he gets up on Christmas morning, he's a new man. The Grinch is given a new heart and I can't remember how it goes, but his, his heart grew three sizes that day. I don't remember, but there's this transformation in their lives. Unfortunately, we don't find a transformation in Herod's life. And let me say this, God is in the business of changing lives. God's in the, in the business of transforming people into something new. God is in the business of, of making you a new creature and me a new creature. That is the business that God is in. And we find it happening again and again biblically. You find it with Matthew. He was a tax collector and he became a disciple. And God used him to write the gospel of Matthew. We find Mary, a prostitute that became a believer and gave sacrificially. We find Saul that persecuted the church, became the first missionary for Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, Herod doesn't change. The transformation that God will do is only done if we accept it. It's only done if we receive Christ. It's only done if we let Him work in our lives. I tell you all, every, almost every Sunday morning when we come to church, open up your ears and your minds and your hearts. Let God change you. Let God make a difference. Let God speak to you. And we can come in and sit in church every single Sunday and we can put up a blockade rather than, rather than listening to what the preacher has to say, rather than listening to the songs. We can, we can look at our phones or, or, or we, can, we can think about other things. We can be distracted. We can block it out audibly. We can block it out mentally. We can choose to disregard and choose to say, well, the preacher shared that illustration before. Or, or boy, look at that. The preacher made another mistake. He, he said Julius Caesar instead of Caesar Augustus. And he had the wrong reference. I'm full of mistakes. Boy, I'll tell you, I'm full of mistakes. He said, he said Harry Potter. And uh, you know, look at all these. And we, we can choose to mentally pick. And, and we can pick out all the negative. Hey, listen. I'm going to make mistakes. Amen? Now you say amen, right? I'll make mistakes. And, and, and things won't go perfectly. And we can go, oh, look at all this. Look at, that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong. And we can mentally, we can choose to, to focus on something different than what God's doing. We can choose to harden our heart. Not let God in. Not let God change us. Can I tell you something? This isn't hard to do. This is not, this isn't rocket surgery. This isn't hard to do. But here's what's going to happen. If we'll open up our ears, we'll listen for God to speak to us. We'll open up our minds and actually think about and comprehend it. And we'll open up our hearts and, and see where God's applying His message, His word to us. Can I tell you what will happen? God will come in and God will make a change. God will make a difference in our lives. God can change us. And the Christmas story, it's got, I, I, I just drew out two transformations that we have. Just very quickly, I, I won't take much time on this. Joseph was a man. He found out that his espoused wife, his, his fiance, was pregnant. And we looked at this in Sunday school today. He was going to put her away privily. He was just going to send her away so she wouldn't be embarrassed. He was going to disconnect himself from her life. But the angel of the Lord came and gave him the message of God and gave him the truth that, that she was going to bear the Messiah. She was going to bear the Christ. And she's still a virgin. And, and God gave him that message about Mary and, and, and that God was going to use Jesus Christ. He was going to be the Messiah. He was going to be God with us. And, and Joseph believed it. And Joseph changed his path. He turned himself around. And instead of, of putting Mary aside, he married Mary. He obeyed God. I love the story of the shepherds, and we don't have time to go there in Luke chapter number 2. In Luke chapter number 2, the angel of the Lord shows up to those shepherds. They're in the field watching their flocks by night, and he tells them that, that, that in Bethlehem, the, 
Messiah was born and the whole heavenly host, they come and sing praises and these shepherds are so excited. They're so thrilled. They said, let's go see the Messiah. Let's go see Jesus. And they go to that manger and, and they, they go to that stable and they find the Messiah and they go about all the town and praising God and, 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 and exalting Him and telling everybody that they run into about Jesus the Messiah was born. Here they were. They were just working their job. And now they're the first ones to proclaim the birth of Jesus Christ. What a change. What a transformation. You say, oh, these are just simple. These are just small things. Can I tell you something? God's in the business of transforming lives. It may be, it may be just in, in, your, in your, the way you think. It may be in the thing that you do. It may be in your heart itself where God can take the, 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 the vilest, the most wicked of sinners, the, the, the tax collector like Matthew, the prostitute like Mary Magdalene, or, or, the, or the wicked uh, guy that hated Christians and hated the church like Saul. And, and God can work in that heart and transform that life and turn Turn that life around and, and produce something beautiful and wonderful and productive. But God wants to transform your life today. This Christmas can be transforming for you. It can turn your whole life around. Are you ready to let God change you this Christmas? I'll tell you something, Christian, if you're not... If you're a Christian today, if you're not growing, if you're not teachable, you're, you're dead. You're missing out on what God has for you. If you're new to church, if you're new to Christ, and, and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, can I tell you something? God wants to be a part of your life, and it's about letting Him in. It's not about doing a list of good deeds, of, of getting baptized, and, and, and joining the church, and, and reading my Bible, and, and taking communion. It's not a list of good works that you have to do, but rather it's receiving Jesus and letting Him change you and transform you. But there's transformation, there's change available this Christmas. What we're really talking about here is a triumphant Christmas. You want to have a victorious, a triumphant Christmas? I will give you three things that you can do. Three things that are found here in our text. You have Herod on the one hand, and you have these wise men on the other. And they're an integral part of, of the Christmas account, even though they don't actually show up until some time later, but they show up when God wants them to show up. And when, when they encounter Jesus Christ at the time where they're going to need to be there, Joseph and his family are going to need them. It's going to be at a time according to God's purpose and plan. And look at what happens when these wise men show up. Look in verse number 11. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Let me share with you a couple of thoughts here about this triumphant Christmas. First of all, our God is glorified in a triumphant Christmas. God is glorified. It's, it's not about me. It's not about what I get. It, it's not about how I feel. It, it's not about how good a job I've done making other people feel good. It's not about me. It's not about how I feel. But it's God that's lifted up and glorified. And I love these wise men when they come in. The Bible, the Bible describes Jesus here as a young child at this point. But when they come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and worshipped Him. They got on their faces before Jesus Christ, this young child, and worshipped Him. There is humility here. There is there's this humble nature where Christ is lifted up. God is glorified. And it wasn't comfortable. It wouldn't have been easy, but when they recognize Jesus Christ for who He is, they're going to worship Him. And what is Christmas about if it's not about Christ? You find in triumphant Christmas that a gift is given. 
and these are gifts of great value. I'm not going to take time to, to break down the gifts, the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh, but there's great value and great meaning here. I, I don't know what the most valuable present you've ever received was. I, you know, you've seen the commercials where Christmas morning, they open up the front door of the house, they look out, there's a brand new car with a big red bow on top. Any of y'all got one of those Christmases before? That, that's a pretty expensive gift. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh were of great value. They were, they were costly. And, and let me say this about giving a gift, because we give gifts. We give and we exchange and, and, and we get. And, and, and gifts are given at Christmas time. That's part of our tradition. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about recognizing what Christmas is about. And, and if you've been around very long, you, you know I say this almost every Christmas. I try to. Christmas is, Christmas is Jesus' birthday, not yours. What are you going to give Jesus for Christmas? Not your kids and, and not your aunts and uncles and, and, and not your friends and, and not your boss at work. What are you going to give Jesus for Christmas? It's His birthday. If it's about Him, what are you going to give to Him? What are you going to do to honor Him? What are you going to do to glorify Him? What are you going to do to sacrifice for Him? And, and, and I mean sacrifice. Giving a gift should cost us something. And, and David talks about that in 2 Samuel 24. Uh, 24 he says, Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my, my God, which doth cost me nothing. He says, I'm not going to offer to God something that doesn't cost me anything. He said, well, I found $5 the other day, so I'm going to give God a dollar. That's not a gift. That's not a sacrifice. What, is, what are we going to give to God? And we're not just talking about money. And it's easy to put it in terms of dollars and cents. But I'll tell you what, there's things much more valuable than money. Your time. Your focus. Your heart. What are you going to give to Jesus Christ who came, God, who came down in a fleshly form, uh, limited Himself to be like us, faced temptation every sense just like us, went to a cruel cross to be mocked and beaten and, 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 and betrayed and, and strung up there to, to, to die and to take our sins upon Himself. What are you going to do for Jesus Christ? If you love Him, if you serve Him, what can you give Him as a gift? It's not a payment for salvation. What can you give Him as a gift? If you love of Jesus, what are you going to give him? A triumphant Christmas means that a gift is given. And it means the gospel, God's word, is going to be our guide. A triumphant Christmas means that we're going to do what God's word says, not what we say, not what feels right to us. Because we live in the day and age, folks, in which if it feels good to me, that's what I'm going to do. That's what's right. That's my truth. I, hate, I say that several times because you hear it out there in the world, and I despise it, and I echo it in here just to, 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 to put it down and to mock it because it is something that people believe. It's my truth. It feels good to me. It feels right to me. It's how, it's how I look at the world, so it's the right way to do things. Can I tell you something, folks? If God's Word says it's sin. It doesn't matter how you feel. It's sin. If God's Word says to do it and it's right, even though you may not want to do it, you ought to do it because it's the right thing to do. It's about God. It's about God's Word as our guide. Not about how we feel. Not about your truth, but about the truth. God's truth. God has something for you to do today. God wants to guide and direct you today. God, God wants you to take a step closer to Him through Jesus Christ today. God wants this Christmas to be victorious and triumphant. God wants to steer you away from the tragic. Because there's somebody here, you've never actually bowed your head and, and confessed to God, I'm a sinner, I need Jesus Christ to save me. There's somebody here today that needs to accept Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior. There's somebody here that God's saying, you need to obey my word, not just the parts you like, but all of it. It's time for you to worship God. It's time for you to serve Christ.
It's time to be involved in His church. It's time to read His Word. It's time to spend time in prayer. It's time to grow spiritually. It's time to let God transform and change you, to yield yourself to God so that He can do a work in your life and, and make you better. Can I tell you something? Here's the truth. God loves you just the way you are. But He loves you way too much to let you stay that way. You come to God right now. You don't have to get your life right to come to God. You come to God right now. God will accept you as you are. But you have to understand that with that, when we give ourselves to God, He's going to begin to work in us to make us better. And the yielding and surrendering of ourselves is the beginning of the work that God has for you today. God is in the job. He is in the work. He is in the process of changing lives. And God can change your life if you will let Him. Herod said no. Herod said, I want to do it my way. The next thing we read about Herod is that Herod died. But you know what? God came and spoke to Matthew. And Matthew said, I'm going to do it your way. Mary Magdalene said, I'm going to do it your way. Saul said, I'm going to do it your way. He became Paul. Joseph, God came to Joseph and said, here's the truth. Here's what I want. Joseph said, I'll do it your way. The shepherd said, I'm going to do it your way. God's knocking at the door of your heart. What are you going to tell him? What are you going to tell him today? God wants to change you. God wants to transform you. God wants, wants to be closer to you. What are you going to tell him?